Before we get started with the panel, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming and welcome you to The Hive and introduce Tom, who's going to say a few words about this space, which I imagine as freelancers uh, you'll all be interested in. <laughs> um, this. Thank you. Okay. Spending our time here. How are you doing, everybody? Uh, welcome to The Hive. Uh, how many of you have never been here before? Ah, oh, it's fantastic. Well, uh, I hope you're enjoying the view. It's a beautiful day for it. And uh, welcome to our space. We are a community, creativity, sustainability, co-working space in Vancouver. The way it works here is um, instead of renting a an office, small businesses and entrepreneurs rent desks. It's a lot more cost effective and it, and it allows for scalability and it works really well. In addition, the area that you're in now is called the hot desking area. How many of you are familiar with the concept of hot desking? Good. Ah, oh, this is the perfect dynamic. None of you have been here before and it's all a brand new thing. So basically the idea is that, uh, and this is really good for aspiring writers like yourself, the idea is that you come in here and you are able to work in an office environment where it's kind of you know, quiet and people are, are serious minded, but you get to meet a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different industries who don't do exactly the same thing that you do. This is great because it instantly expands your network. And you're not, you don't have to buy muffins and coffee from, from the barista uh, you know, from the coffee shop that you'd normally be in. So, we're home to over 50 uh, small organizations, small and medium-sized organizations. There's permanent desks out back. Behind that white wall over there uh, is Mozilla, makers of the Firefox browser. And they're actually moving out um, at the end of this month because they're moving back to their original space across the street to the flat building. So we actually, this is a good time for you all to be here because we have a lot of space that's opening up just over there and a few desks down there. So if you know anyone who has a business, has needs, needs office space and you know is looking, we can accommodate you. So uh, if so, see me or Tara or anyone else uh, around the reception desk. And with that, I want to welcome you to the Hive. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Colleen Kimmett. I'm a contributing editor at the Taiyi. And I want to thank uh, my fellow Taiyisters for help making this happen. Uh, Julie and Jess, who are here tonight setting up, and uh, everyone else at the office who are just uh, a really great bunch of people. And uh, this is a panel on, uh, oh, I have to thank our sponsors too, who gave us money to put this on. Uh, UBC J School, UBC Journalism School, the Professional Writers Association of Canada, and uh, the Canadian Freelance Union which is under the uh, CEP. So, uh, welcome again. This, um, this panel dis discussion is on how to pitch, which is a very frustrating part of being a freelance writer. It's something that was not covered when I went to journalism school. I went to Carleton. Uh, we were trained to work for the CBC and the Globe and Mail and the Ottawa Citizen. And then we graduated and there were no jobs there. So we were you know, thrust into this world where every freelancer is uh, uh, an independent business person. And the pitch is how you sell your business. The pitch is how you sell yourself, your story. So it's an important topic. And I'm really pleased with the uh, panelists we have, <coughs> beginning with uh, Aaron Miller. Uh, Aaron is a prolific freelance journalist and an author of the Canadian Campus Companion. Uh, she's written for the Reader's, for Reader's Digest, The Walrus, The Globe and Mail, and Maclean's. And Erin's um, done a number of seminars on this very topic for uh, student journalists, so I, I'm, I know she'll have a lot to say. Jane Naherney. Am I pronouncing your last name? Naherney. Apologize. Uh, editor in chief of British Columbia Magazine. Um, Jane has worked as a writer uh, and an editor, so she's got a great perspective as well. She's been on uh, both sides of the table. And she has uh, written and edited for a number of national and regional magazines, Canadian Home Style, Golf Canada, and Wedding Bells before uh, uh, coming to British Columbia Magazine. Uh, next we have Gary Stephen Ross, editor-in-chief of Vancouver Magazine. Gary is a best-selling author and he is, used to be the editor at Saturday Night Magazine, which was, uh, I don't know if anyone at West is familiar, as familiar with it, but Saturday Night was a great publication and uh, was sorry to see it go, but anyhow. Uh, and David Jordan is the executive editor at BC Business Magazine. David is the former editor of Granville Magazine, 
the associate editor of, uh, and former associate editor of business in Vancouver, and he teaches writing at uh, UBC and SFU. Used to, Used to teach yeah. writing at UBC and SFU. Okay, so um, I asked the, um, I feel very low down here. <laughs> Can people see? No? Okay, I'm just a disembodied voice down here. Well, uh, feel free to move around if you want to find a better spot or... Anyway, we'll get started. Um, so I asked everyone to begin... Um, I, I sent some questions out. And the first one, I think we can just go uh, down the line here, um, beginning with... Uh, well, let's begin with David. Um, so the question is, just tell us a bit about your publication and what a freelancer should should know. Um, David? Okay, well, as our... Uh, should I be speaking yeah. into this? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. As our title would suggest, we're about BC and business. So those are the two criteria. Every, any story we publish has to be about business and specifically business in BC. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be a business writer to, to write for us. Uh, in fact, most of the people who write for us aren't business writers, uh, or if they are now, weren't when they started writing for us. Um, it just means that's the angle you have to look for if you're writing for, if you're writing about, uh, I don't know, whatever, a restaurant, rather than write about how the food tastes, you're gonna write about how much it costs, where, where they buy it, what their profit is, that sort of thing. So it's just finding the business angle in whatever story you're pitching. Um, how much freelance writing do we use? It, it varies. Uh, at the moment, uh, quite a bit, because we have a fairly new team that's settling in and not as much as being in, written in-house as usual. Uh, our magazine is, has three sections. There's a front of book section, which is short little bits. Ordinarily, that's written all in-house. Uh, the, the, main section of the magazine is the longer features which run from 2,000 to 5,000 words. Those are always freelance. Uh, and then we have a back of the book section which is more sort of a lifestyle section. It's uh, uh, restaurants and fashion. And, uh, those we have pretty regular freelancers that, that write for. So the key to getting into writing for BC Business is probably, if you've never written for us before, First of all, familiarize yourself with the magazine. That's that's step number one. Um, but try pitching for one of the little stories in the front of the magazine. We've got little stories that run 350 to 600 words. If you try your hand at one or two of those and it works out well, uh, there's a good chance you could move on to write some bigger features for us. Uh, well, I'll, I'll cut it short there. I'm sure I'll elaborate okay. later on. So. And uh, yeah, if you could just pass the, the okay. mic to Gary. Thank you. Uh, Vancouver Magazine uh, has been around for 45 years, I realize, since we're publishing our 45th anniversary issue at this very moment, or we're in production of that issue. Uh, so it's the city magazine. Every major city has one. Our models, I guess, would be New York Magazine, which is kind of the king of city magazines. Toronto Life is a very good city magazine. Um, Philadelphia has a good one. Atlanta has a good one, Los Angeles has a very good city magazine, and what they all have in common, uh, as David said about BC and business, the first sieve that things have to pass through at Van Mag is, is this a real Vancouver story? You know, the greatest Pulitzer Prize winning piece about a murder in Edmonton, of course, is not right for Van Mag. So, um, the other thing that David said which is key is, familiarize yourself with the magazine, study it. It's amazing how many freelancers send out generic pitches. I'm sure they sent them to four different magazines at the same time. And it's, the pitch is, here's a story I want to write, or here's something I know about and I want to write. And what you really need to be doing is solving my problem with the pitch. And my problem is, how do I fill the magazine with really interesting Van Mag material? And for you to help me with that, you have to know what our definition of really interesting Van Mag material is. Uh, we're a somewhat unusual magazine, as city magazines go, in that uh, the majority of our circulation is controlled 
meaning the magazine is dropped at people's doorsteps because of their desirability as consumers. Mm -hmm. So um, I was hired uh, six years ago now, and I was uh, hired because the previous editor had seen a decline in readership of the magazine of 30% in three years. It's really hard to shed 30% of your readership in three years. In fact, you could set out to do so and fail. And so my, my mandate was, why are people not reading Van Mag? And the answer was actually pretty simple. And it was that the magazine was being edited by young people who were communicating their notion of what they thought was interesting in the city. And so, but the magazine was being distributed to people who lived in Coal Harbor and West Van and Shaughnessy and Kitts and North Van and so on. So the editors thought that, you know, Black Mountain and the new pornographers were wonderful. <laughs> and people in West Van and Coal Harbor who are downloading the latest Michael Buble tracks thought, you know, what, what's in this magazine for me? So they, you have to familiarize yourself, you have to understand what a magazine is and who it's speaking to and why it's speaking to that audience. So our challenge at Van Mag is to mix the kind of material that, uh, that advertisers want to you know, attract readers with. So we do a lot about food and drink, we do fashion, you know, shiny happy people, Ma Malcolm Perry's photographs at charity events and that sort of thing. And the trick is, how do you mix that with really substantial journalism? So what we're looking for is material that fits one or other of those bills. Uh, you know, solid, interesting, investigative pieces, deeply researched pieces, really well-written pieces, and then guides to the best spas in the city, you know, where to get the best Chinese food, whatever it may be. Uh, but the, the key in there is you have to know the market that you're pitching to, I mean, you have to study the magazine, and when you pitch, it's very useful if you say, so the story that I'm proposing would be quite a bit like the piece you ran in April on so-and-so, a profile that actually is making the argument that we need to change the healthcare system, let's say. Um, so generic pitches don't work. The pitch that you send out, the same pitch to six different magazines does not work. Each magazine has a mission statement, it's on its website probably, it has a very clear notion of what it's trying to do, and I repeat, your job as a freelancer is to try and help you know, the, the editors here solve the problem of how do we get more Van Mag material or BC Business material into our magazine. And I think, um, I think maybe it's just for sound, it's just a matter of holding the mic close, close enough to your mouth, so uh, let's keep that in mind. Uh, Jane, what, what can you tell us about British Columbia Magazine and what you're looking for? It's going to sound, I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record here because, you know, we are about British Columbia. We're about the entire province. We're the scenic and geographic uh, uh, magazine of the province. We, we cover all the regions. We are not just a travel magazine, though. Our mandate, the short version of our mandate is we're really striving to entertain, inform. I want to delight and surprise our readers as well. Uh, with the diversity of the province, not just nature, but remarkable people, uh, scientific uh, discoveries, uh, geology, First Nations culture, history, uh, and so on. We have, uh, we have a diverse group of readers, much like uh, uh, as, as Gary was just describing. They sort of range, the core readers range from 35 to 65 years old, some of them are much older and have been with the magazine since its very earliest days. We're 53 years old now, so we we have a challenge too because we have to appeal to a very broad age group. Uh, we also have sections of the magazine that are really great for freelancers to break into. We have an upfront section of the magazine called Due West, and those pieces tend to be between 100 and 350 words. And as uh, the other two editors mentioned, Please read our magazine and read our guidelines as well. The guidelines are very specific as to what we're looking for. They're three pages long. I glanced at them when I was a freelancer. I was really scared off by them, but but there's they're so detailed that you'll get a really clear picture of what it takes to have a successful pitch. And uh, basically, we we really just 
want you to read the magazine and uh, and and try to you know give us something really fresh. Uh, so we always say a, a destination is not a pitch. Because we'll get emails, hey, I'd like to do a story about merit. And we're like, mm, so <laughs> it has to pass the so what test, or it won't pass with our readers. Our readers are very opinionated, they're well-traveled, they're well-read, about 62% of them are British Columbians, and the rest are spread all around the world. Um, 100 countries our magazine is distributed to. We have about 880,000 readers per issue, um, and we get that readership uh, from our high readers per issue, about 11.7 readers per issue. So the magazine's really passed around I think that's about it, but uh, the Due West section is the gateway to be published in our magazine. Um, so I would really recommend welcome pitches to that section. Have a look at what we do in there. It tends to be quirkier, shorter um, uh, subjects, and uh, and we really welcome any pitches you might want to send us there in particular. Uh, well, yeah, if you can pass the mic to Erin, because I have a question for her. The uh, your message here seems to be know, know the magazine, study it well, so you know exactly the kind of stories they're looking for. Erin, uh, maybe you could, well, I'm curious if you, um, if you get an idea and then try to find an angle that would work for a particular magazine, or if you find a magazine you really like and decide, okay, this month I'm going to come up with a story idea that would be perfect for that magazine? How, how does it work? Um, that's actually exactly what I wanted to comment uh, on. I wanted to elaborate from the freelancer's perspective um, on, uh, on something that Gary Stephen Ross said about um, pitches that, that editors receive that are clearly generic and they might be going to three magazines at the same time, which you shouldn't do, by the way. That's a no-no. Uh, and I try to, I try not to, to get too attached to a single idea. Um, I've got, I usually have quite a few ideas going, most of them half-baked at best in my notebook at any given time. Um, and, uh, and rather than like get super attached to one idea for that big feature that I want to do and putting tons and tons of research into it, I mean I do research my pitches, that's important of course, but um, and then, you know, spending two weeks on that one idea and then shopping it around to one magazine and then waiting until it gets rejected in the next magazine and so on. I try to, to approach um, it by thinking about what magazines I want to work at. And, uh, and it can't be too many because, you know, you're managing relationships here. So for me, you know, and it's different for everybody, but for me, I can't really manage 10 editors all at the same time if I want to have ongoing relationships with them um, where I'm getting more steady work. Uh, and that's important to my bottom line. So what I'm trying to do when I'm approaching a new editor, um, it's somebody that I've read the magazine, you know, thoroughly enough to know that I want to work there. Um, and then uh, I'm going to research that magazine and see what they're doing. There's nothing that suggests that you're not um, a thorough researcher than pitching a story that was in last month's magazine. So I make sure that that hasn't happened, there's not a topic. Um, and then go to the editor, making clear that I'm, you know, I, I'm interested in, in working with them, not just about this one idea. And sometimes I come with more than one idea. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, I'm not going to spam them with five ideas because that's, you know, it's going to take an editor a long time to devote the amount of time to reading all that. So I'll go with a couple of different ideas, maybe some front of book ideas um, that are the shorter articles, then a more developed pitch that kind of suggests what I want to move towards. Um, and then I try to think about it as starting a relationship, starting a conversation, rather than just that one-off idea. Because if you're only attached to that one idea, then the second that idea is rejected, the conversation's over. Um, so instead of doing that, I try to, um, um, to start a conversation with that editor. And if the idea doesn't work, I'll ask them um, you know, why it didn't work, what are they looking for. And, uh, and in most cases, if I've, if I've done my research and I've showed that I'm, I'm, uh, I've done my homework, then editors are very open to, to sharing with me. Because I think, and I don't know what you guys would say about this, um, my fellow panelists, but most editors who I've worked with are, are looking for good writers and are looking for good freelancers and good ideas. Um, they need fresh ideas and, uh, and they're willing to put in the time to help you be able to deliver the ideas they need. So, yeah. Well, maybe editors, you could weigh in on that. Uh, what I mean by that is this idea of having, um, you know, 
relationships with, with writers and how willing you are to banter an idea back and forth or take more than one idea at a time. Does anyone want to weigh in on that? Okay. I can weigh in on that. Uh, it, it really is all about relationships. Uh, it, you should be dealing with it in the same way you deal with any other respectful relationship that you're, you're just starting up. Um, we, one thing I, I wanted to mention is we were only quarterly, so we, we actually don't have a lot of opportunities there. So when you make your pitch, it's just fabulous if you've done what Aaron suggested and really researched it and, and, and try to build a relationship instead of a one-off idea. Because if I know about you, we develop also a lot of ideas, as I'm sure the other panelists do as well, in-house. So, because we, some idea comes to us, we hear something in the, in the wind, and, and, and then if we know about you, we know what your skills are, we'll think of you, and then we'll work with you uh, to develop that idea. So it really is about relationships. Very important. Uh, I've got something to say. Sure. <laughs> It ain't about relationships for me. It's about finding wonderful material. And, um, well, you know, well, my. Saying, but, you know, <laughs> I've published lots of work by people I've never met. Um, you know, I. We get tons of pitches, and most of them are not very good. So they can. They're either generic or, you know, it is something that was in the magazine two months ago, and they haven't bothered even going on the website and kind of looking through it, I live to find killer pieces. And, um, you know, the piece that you want to be selling is the piece, really, that only you can write. Anybody can come along and say, here's five ideas for stories. Uh, you know, is Cole Harbor getting too dense? I want to explore that. Or should we really have, uh, you know, bicycle lanes, or should we not have bicycle lanes, whatever. I'm a cyclist, and I want to explore that. First of all, that's not really a pitch. That's a subject area. That's not pitching a story. That's sort of uh, suggesting a way of you know, getting your foot in the door and then pay me to go out and figure out what I think. I want to know what you think when you get to the door. But what I really want is for the, for the pitch to say, you know, I got knocked off my bicycle uh, two years ago at the corner of First and McDonald. And uh, I'm just starting to walk again. And I've spent those two years thinking about how our city is used and how transportation ought to work. And that's the pitch where I think, wow, yeah. You know, I want to talk to this guy, this woman. Um, there's going to be something here that isn't there in the kind of generic thing about I want to look into this. Or... So but, you know, my passion is to find original, authentic voices. Um, if you're in the record business, I'm sure that's what you do. And I'm sure you hear a hundred Katy Perry's who are basically confections. And then every once in a while you hear an Adele who is like a real, fresh, new, authentic performer, artist. So I'm looking for original, authentic voices and people who have kind of unique stories. And when I come across great story ideas, I'm very careful when we do it, the magazine, how we assign them. We just did a piece uh, called The Big One in a recent issue on the anniversary of the Japanese quake about what would happen if the big one struck here as it did in, in 1700. And uh, Remy Skalza, who's a freelancer, we studied his work. He's done work at BC Business, a very talented writer, and he did a bang up job. When we tripped, when we tripped over a story about an Iranian and, Ara and an Iraqi who met during the Iran-Iraq War in 1980, uh, I don't know if any of you read that piece. It's called Blood Brothers. Just a killer story. It's going to win magazine awards in Toronto in June. I'm certain. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time. We tripped over that story because we invite people to our editorial meetings, outsiders, just to come in and see what they have to say and stuff, and. A woman who is a photographic intern, we're pitching, we're throwing around story ideas at the meeting, and she, at the end of the meeting, comes up and says to me, I don't know if you'd find this interesting. She's very shy, but I volunteer at a place called the Vancouver Association for Survivors of Torture, which I'd never heard of, and she said, I ran across these two guys there, and they said they have kind of an interesting story. The one guy was, his job was to kill the other guy when he was captured in 1980, and instead, at the risk of his own life, he saved him, 
They both ended up in prison. They both ended up being tortured. They both ended up coming to Vancouver. They both ended up at the Vancouver Association for Survivors of Torture. They recognized each other, and they're now best friends. Now that's a story. Wow. <laughs> and Timothy Taylor is a wonderful writer, so we went to Tim and said, you know, will you take this on? And he said, well, you need to pay me a lot of money. And I said, we can't pay you a lot of money, but, but here's what I think. I used to be a book publisher, and I've also been in, in, in movies a little bit. I said, there's a book in this, and there's a film in this. So why don't you use this magazine piece as a way to kind of develop a book and movie kind of outlook and pitch. So he did, wrote a wonderful piece. Uh, Random House is turning it into a book and he's talking to Bright Light Pictures about a film. So um, anyway. Gary, how often does that happen that you'll come across? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, hold on. I'm, I'm talking about uh, saying, hey, freelancer or writer can, I, will you write this story versus, uh, like how often do you assign ver stories versus um, accept uh, queries and then assign? We probably generate two thirds of what's in the magazine in house and a third of it is freelance. Okay. David, did you want to lay on this um, too? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that uh, idea of relationships that, uh, that Aaron brought up. And I, I can see Gary's point of view. I, can you just hold the mic a little closer? Okay, from the editor's point of view, a relationship uh, doesn't matter. All you want is a good story. But I also understand from the freelancer's point of view, writing one good story isn't going to help your career much if you don't get another story after that. Uh, and in fact, once I hire a writer to write a story, it's pretty rare that I'll never talk to that writer again. Once their foot's in the door, we, we have a relationship, and I will listen next time they call the story idea. I may call them to ask if they want to write a story. And by the way, we uh, probably generate even more stories than, than Gary does. But most of our stories are generated in-house just because of a, a dearth of good pitches. Um, you know, the, the good pitches I get a month are, are probably one or two. Uh, and the rest are just stories we generate and I call up a writer I know and say, do you want to write this? Um, but back to that idea of relationships, and it touches on another point that Aaron brought up, which is research which uh, she sort of seemed to assume it goes without saying that a pitch takes good research. Um, but I don't see a lot of research in most of the pitches I get. And that's because a, a good pitch is actually work. It's a lot of work and it's unpaid work. Um, and to me, a really good pitch will show that the writer has made a few phone calls, they've talked to one or two people, and they can give me a quote in their pitch saying, you know, this is a uh, a key topic and you know the CEO of XYZ company uh, comments you know this or whatever and, and throws in a few statistics that they've looked up somewhere that will get my ear as opposed to uh, the vast majority of pitches I get were, which are just I was thinking about this that and the other thing and, and I think it's pretty important and it's really well I, I can give an example I got a pitch recently from uh, actually a, a very good professional writer who's written a lot for us and I know he's very talented but I, I get a lot of pitches from him along this line. Um, the federal government uh, is, is, uh, has uh, introduced legislation to, to water down environmental regulations. Uh, you know, business thinks this will be great. Environmentalists thinks it's not so great. How about I look into it? Well, you know, I, you haven't told me anything. I, I, don't already know that I haven't read in the paper a dozen times already, so sorry, I don't see a story here. Uh, if you found some quirky angle and, and talked to a business that's going to be affected by this, who could tell them, yeah, I'm going to be out of business tomorrow if, if this regulation is passed, or I guess it more likely, uh, yeah, I'm going to triple my profit next year if this, if this legislation is passed. Okay, then we've got something solid to work on, but, but not just, this is really important to me and I want to look into it. Uh, I'm never going to assign a story like that. Um, so, in tying this in with relationships, that, wh when you're pitching me cold, that's the first basis of our relationship, the story idea. If we've got something to talk about, we've got a common ground. If you can interest me in this idea, um, yeah, we can chat about it and I can say, well, you know, I think it's a good idea, but you have to do this or that or the other thing. Uh, you can go away and do some more research. But if there's no substance to your pitch, there's no start of a relationship, and we're probably never going to talk again. So, yeah, that's that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Jane. Uh, yeah, when I'm talking about relationships, I don't want to leave the impression that I'm looking to make friends. It's not about that. It, it, is, it is what you were mentioning. Uh, I want to be able to trust you. Um, some of our best writers, the pitches that they've sent can, can be just now one line because I trust them, because I've worked with them for a couple of years now. I know, um, and I can work on the story idea with them so that we're both happy with it. Uh, but you need to build that trust, and it is relationship building. We too want very high quality journalism, and we've had it, and uh, that that is the key thing. But uh, I need to know who you are, what you can do, and um, first, first of all. So I've heard a few things, um, a few specific things that uh, should or shouldn't be in a pitch. Um, don't, you know, don't pitch a story idea that's been in the magazine recently. Uh, I thought it was uh, interesting, David, that you said a quote, uh, yeah. you know, to show that you've done some phone calls, that you've talked to some people, uh, and, you know, you can, presumably, they could be future interview subjects, so the editor has an idea of, of you know, who the, who the sources are will be for this story. Are there any other really specific things you can think of that you want to see in any kind of query letter, not, you know, necessarily your own publication? Uh, okay, I'll answer that in short order. Uh, the pitch is the opportunity for you to show that you're not like every other writer, that you don't think and express yourself in cliches, that you can use language in an interesting and strong way that you can approach things unconventionally or from a kind of oblique or striking angle. So you want your pitch not to sound like everybody else's pitch in the same way, again, if you're a record executive and you hear band after band after band, it all just becomes noise. Then when you hear the band that you know, is tight and fresh and has got it, you, suddenly you pay attention. So, I would take great care with the pitch. You know, concision is all in writing. And as soon as you get really kind of bloated, flaccid descriptions of things and long-winded introductions, you sort of think, okay, this person can't actually write very well or they wouldn't, you know, the pitch wouldn't sound like this. So the pitch is your chance to kind of put your stamp on how you write, how you think, whether you can bring freshness and, and that kind of vivid sense of things which is what we're looking for, I think. Uh, I could just add one really quick point to that. Uh, you can go a little too far that way, too, with trying to inject too much personality into a pitch. I just got one this week by somebody who was writing as though she was my best friend. Hey, David, how's it going? You know, well, I was just swinging by this really cool uh, restaurant. I had the best meal I ever had. And, you know, just, no, I just didn't even want to read it. So too much individuality can, can be a turn off, too. I'd love to see a clip. Clip is very, very important. I don't want to see 10 clips. I don't want to have to go to major links and spend too much time looking at your material, but send me your best clip. And then please be aware that I'm going to look at every word in your email with great scrutiny. So read it, proof it, and really express your personality in it, um, as the other two were saying. And just be careful, because you can really leave the wrong impression if there's a typo in your subject line. And I've seen it. Can I add something to that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, just uh, about clips. I think it's also important to send a relevant clip. I've made this mistake a couple times, sending a clip that's a, you know, a, biz, a great business story I did with David when I'm pitching a travel story. So, um, yeah, think about that the pitch is actually demonstrating what that editor is going to be looking for in terms of skills. Um, and then, uh, very quickly, I just have a list of things that I, uh, that I try to include in a pitch. That's always my starting point. It's very concrete. Um, and I never actually end up writing the pitch in that specific form because every story is different. But, um, I think of it in sort of three sections. The first section, I try to demonstrate, A, that I can write, either by uh, having those choice quotes or creating a scene or um, showing that I can write about some character in a concise manner um, and also try to hook the, writer, or the editor, um, if that's possible, in a short amount of time. 
The second section I sort of think about is show that I can report, that I've made a couple of phone calls, that um, I'm not just uh, throwing out what anyone can read in the news, that I actually have some reporting skills. Um, that section is also sort of going to include um, something about the theme, why this is important to the readers. Um, that's generally where uh, I'll bring in something like that. And then the third thing I'm trying to demonstrate in a pitch is that I'm the right writer to write this. Um, either I have access to sources that is unique, or I have a personal connection to the story that's unique, or my expertise, or whatever. Um, and I'll also suggest sort of what my angle is in that section. And again, that's just my starting point where I try to hit all those things, but my pitches never end up being exactly like that. But that's, uh, that's my little list in my mind anyways. About, uh, could you say how long it takes you to formulate a pitch? Like how much time would you spend putting them together? Um, it really varies depending on what the story is. If it's one of those big feature pitches um, that I'm hoping to get, you know, one of those 5,000 word stories for, which are pretty rare and hard to, hard to get, I'm going to put, it's going to take me days to do that. It's not going to happen in two days. It's going to be, you know, I might do a little work on it every, every day, do it 15 minutes here or half an hour there for a few weeks, and it'll take that long. Um, sometimes I might just crank it out. Shorter pitches, I'm, I'm turning around fast, especially if they're in my area of expertise. I write about education a lot, so if I'm writing about that, I can turn those around a little bit faster just because I have a basis of knowledge. But I would say anywhere from an afternoon to a couple of days. Um, typos, again, you know, a story, their idea that's been in the magazine already. Any other red flags that would immediately turn you off a pitch? mentioned this a bit earlier, but I've had, um, I received a pitch a, a couple months ago saying that the writer had always wanted to work for Westworld. Yeah. And that, that was, that was pretty much of a turn off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another one was when uh, the editor of Explore, uh, editor of Westworld and myself were all sent the same pitch at the same time in the same email. Oh. So I imagine that, that none of us took Fight it. Fight it out. This is a great story. What am I doing? It was, it, you know, it was, it was yeah. not a winner. Uh, the red flags. Um, yeah, basically, it, it really, it, you just really want to be so careful because in your clip, as an, as an editor, we all know, and, and as a writer, we know that if we're working with a good editor, a bad writer can be made to look really good. So I'm going to be looking at the content of everything you send me, as I said, very closely so that I can get a feel if it's all matching up. So. Um, another uh, question I wanted to put out there was what, um, what type of writers you like to work with? Um, so, you know, say you successfully, uh, uh, you know, get as an assignment, what type of writers will get another assignment and another assignment and uh, feel free to use specific people if you like, or just the traits that you associate with a, a good writer if you'd like to work with again and again. I could, I could comment on that. Um, to me, there are just a, a couple of traits, and, and it doesn't matter where the writer comes from, or if their background is in uh, lifestyle writing and restaurant reviews or, or uh, science writing, it doesn't matter. If they've got a, a genuine curiosity and they can convince me they really want to learn something and they can demonstrate that they've got really good research skills. That's all I need. I will probably hire that writer. Um, I, because I, I see a lot of writers who just don't understand that basic research part of writing. They think their personality is enough to write a story. They know so much and they're so interesting and they've got such a wonderful voice that they can sit down and write a 5,000 word story. Uh, but to me, the key is curiosity and research, the desire to learn something and the ability to go out and learn it. And, uh, you know, Erin um, was talking about areas of expertise, and she happens to write a bit about education. Um, that doesn't matter to me. Uh, you know, Gary mentioned one writer, Remy Scalza, and, and he wrote it for me uh, way back when he first got to Vancouver. He had no business writing experience whatsoever. I sent him to cover some god-awful opening of a, of a bank office in, a, in an industrial park somewhere, and he wrote an excellent story. He found a way to get some interest into it. 
Uh, he really dug, found some interesting people, got some good quotes, and, and added a, some lively color to it. Um, you know, so a, a good writer who, who knows how to dig can, can get a good story, so that's all. <laughs> I, so, I could say something, yeah. which is that, um, sorry, the way I think about it is uh, what I want in the magazine is really good writers doing really good stories. So I have this kind of grid system where the story is a kind of one, two, or three. And a one is just like, this a perfect story for Van Mag. And then writers are either A, B, or C. So. You know, John Valiant writing about the destruction of Stanley Park in the windstorm, that's a 1A. That's a wonderful writer on a subject that's perfect in our magazine. So you never want to go beyond the Bs and the 2s, but you occasionally do when, when someone who's a lousy writer has a fantastic story. So, I mean, that happened to us. Who is that teacher, Ellison, at, uh, was he a Point Grey? I forget what. DW or something? Uh, I forget what school he was at, but he had been abusing in this quest program, he'd been abusing all the young women at the school when they were in high school. And they had all suddenly realized this got together. And one of the women there attended the trial and wanted to write about it. And she wasn't a writer, uh, but I commissioned her and worked with her because she had a wonderful story to tell. And the first draft was like 9,000 words and the story actually started at about word 4,000, but it didn't matter. We ended up with a really great piece. So that's one of those kind of one C's. But what you really want to be doing as an editor is finding people who are really strong and who bring you stories that are just right for your magazine. That's, that's kind of how I think about what I'm looking for in a freelance writer. Yeah, I, I would really agree. I have, uh, because we have a lot of different coverage areas, science, environmental, uh, conversations, history, we have certain people we know we can call upon in those areas who are experts in those areas, but then a subcategory of what I'm looking for is curiosity, dependability, sharp writing skills, um, factual accuracy. Our, reader, our readers would call us out on the smallest of historical errors. Uh, they really care about accuracy. So I have sort of a two-tiered uh, system and, uh, and also when we do come up with ideas in-house, we'll, we'll turn to those people, or we may try someone new as well, who's specialized in one of those areas. Um, sorry, can I jump Go ahead, yeah, jump I'll in here. Um, I just wanted to say, too, that um, I'm sure that when when Gary's working on those like really big stories, you're probably working in long lead times and, and lots of room for editing and working with people, but, um, so that's a little bit different, but, for like a lot of my, how I'm actually paying the bills is being done by these shorter stories and this regular work so that I can support those longer stories that I'm, I'm really attached to. And um, uh, so I think it's also just really important to, in those cases, make sure that you're being dependable. Like it really is all about trust. Um, make sure you're not messing up your facts and all of that type of stuff. Um, it's very important uh, if you want to get that return work and, and be able to build that kind of stuff. Uh, and then also deadlines. Um, that's something that I've I've had some troubles with. Everybody has some troubles with it, um, but I've found that that's got to be one of my number one priorities is to make my deadlines. And when there's some problem that comes up, because it does happen, to communicate that with my editors and give them the heads up on what's happening. And if the story changes from what I've pitched, make sure that I'm talking to my editors ahead of that time so that I'm delivering the story on time, but also the story that they expect um, on time. So. I, I think, yeah, I think that's a good point too, um, you know, in terms of uh, ad advice for getting repeat work is to deliver the story that you, that you said you were going to write and, and, and do it on time. Um, Let me say something about that. Sure. Uh, a lot of the best stories aren't the stories that get pitched. They're, they take a twist, I find, or they, what the writer thought they were going to unearth, it actually wasn't quite that simple or what on the surface seemed like a clear case of police abuse or something is actually very complicated. And so I, I like the relationship part of this uh, business when it's like, guess what? Somebody phones and they're doing a profile of 
Gary Mason just did a profile of Gibby Jacob, the chief of the Squamish Band, and their plans for how they're going to develop their land at the south end of the Burrard Bridge and the north end of the Lionsgate Bridge, which is really going to shake up the city. And the, what Gary thought he was going to be writing, I'll just say, turned into something quite different. And I'm very glad that he didn't try and kind of stick to the outline that he suggested and just kind of went with it. We ended up with a much stronger, more interesting piece. So it's uh, that part of checking in with the editor and saying, you know what? Or, you know, the character I thought was the interesting character in all this isn't, and his associate is the one, or, you know, his secretary is actually the one who kind of broke it, and he's taking credit for it. So I want to write about her, not him, or whatever it may be. So I, I like that flexibility and letting the story kind of go where it wants to go. Yeah, I just, sorry, one final sentence on that. I, I agree uh, a lot. That's, I mean, that's the funnest part of this business, too, is, is that exchange and working on it with editors. And, um, and I find that it, it is really important to use your editor in these cases. Um, I've sometimes been guilty of, of uh, getting super close to a story in my mind and just sort of disappearing down my hole and coming out with what it is at the end. And, and it will be a much stronger story if you use your editor. These guys are really smart. They have tons of experience and... Um, and you know, and ge generally they enjoy that process too, or they wouldn't be in business. Are um, do you accept uh, only email query letters generally? Like, how do you feel about phone calls or even someone approaching you in person or coming to a meeting? I actually uh, appreciate a phone call, and uh, I know it's intimidating. That that whole initial contact is intimidating for freelancers, but. Um, it's not like you think. You imagine that I, you know, I get dozens of pitches every week, and oh my God, I don't want another one. That's not the case. I'm desperate for pitches, and and I may be uh, different than most editors in that that I, I, you know, I do enjoy talking on the phone, and and the phone is almost like a an anachronism nowadays. People just don't use it anymore. But to me, that's the best form of communication, apart from in person. Which is one step I, I don't take with a with a cold pitch. I, I occasionally get a, a, a pitch saying, "Oh, uh, I'm a writer. Can we get together for coffee?" And my answer is no. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I just don't have time. I, I'd love to sit in a coffee shop and talk about writing and your experience, but I don't have time. So, um, the phone call actually can work for me as long as you, you know you keep it brief and sound out my interest. And, and if I'm not interested, you know you don't prolong it. Email is. Probably best, um, and, you know, short and, and convincing email, introducing yourself and, and with a, the kind of pitch we've been talking about. But actually, I, I don't mind phone calls. So. Uh, I mind phone calls. <laughs> uh, I get so many phone calls, and you know, from you know PR people, and so I much prefer to be approached uh, digitally. to get so many pitches by mail and I'm so happy to get them by email now because they can be organized more easily. I probably get about 400 pitches a year and, and I can only use all told about 50 uh, and so a lot of those are house produced. So it's so much easier to, I really welcome email. Phone is very, very difficult. I will maintain phone uh, relationships with my writers when they're in progress with their stories or when they have a story idea or some, they're somewhere in the province and they hear of something really quirky and weird that's going on. I, I love a phone call, but email really works for me. And if you've sent me a pitch and you haven't heard back from me, I really encourage you to follow up because nagging me really works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so please, uh, do send by email, it really is. Yeah. And, and if you see me in person, I'm really open to that. Um, the, phone, the phone's really difficult, but I will always network with people in person. Love it, it's great. I should backtrack just a bit and say, say the initial cold pitch by phone probably isn't a great idea. A quick email, and if there's any interest from me, <laughs> then a phone call. <laughs> 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 Another uh, uh, question or topic I wanted to ask is how um, have expectations of writers um, changed over the course of your career and you know how that might affect 
writers who are who are out there uh, pitching? Well, I, a trend, a disturbing trend I've seen in recent years is, uh, it's kind of a cliche and I hate to sound elitist or whatever, but I really think the internet has diluted the quality of writing. Um, so I do get a lot of these pitches, like I say, that, that don't have much research in them. They're just off the top of the head. I'm such a neat person. I'm going to write a few thousand words about this, that, or the other thing. Um, and that, that really is a disturbing trend. So. Uh, it, it's almost old school now to, to come across a writer who has some training in, in journalism and, and knowing how to do some research. Um, they're, they're getting fewer and fewer, and I really appreciate it when I, when I find one of those who, who has the basic skills, and then we can talk about story ideas. So. Is, um, maybe this is more applicable to... Um, well, I don't know. I, are you looking for multimedia? Like, is that a bonus if you get someone who can also shoot video or uh, send photos? Um, when, when I'm involved with hiring photographers, if they offer to, uh, that they, if they tell me we can do a video too, I'm all over it. We pay them for it. Um, if you are a double thread, if you're a writer who likes to take photographs, that, that's fantastic. We've started to get into doing web flags on our stories to give more content inf information to the readers. Uh, we'll pay extra for that as well. Um, or we might take a sidebar from your story and ask you if we can run it as a web flag. Um, I, I think the, the difference for writers that I see now is that editors are looking for more packaging than before. Maybe articles are getting a little bit shorter. Um, and not, not significantly in our part, but we're looking at different ways they can be used. We do pay for, when we run an article online, we do pay web rights, but I think there, there, there are more demands on both writers and editors today, I, I see, for sure. Uh, I would say what's changed in the freelance writing community is that it's really, really hard to make a go of it as a freelancer now, harder than ever. Uh, the pay is shit. It's absolute shit. Um, I was a freelance writer. I've been a freelance writer. Well, let me tell you a story. In the mid-1980s, uh, I was at Saturday Night Under Robert Fulford, and I phoned a wonderful writer with a great story idea. Anne Kingston was the writer in Toronto. She's at McLean's now, still, I think. Uh, asked her if she would do this piece. 4,000 words, $4,000, right up her alley, perfect article for her, and she said, she's only four grand, I mean, you're asking me. No. The, the piece was about uh, Dave Nichol, the guy who invented sort of no-name stuff, no-name products back then. Um, a, 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 it was a thing at the time, and she was the perfect writer for it. She was all over branding and retailing and everything. She said, you want me to do two or three months' work for $4,000 is what you're asking, and I said, you know what, that's right, but if you can't do it, you can't do it. Exactly 20 years later, I was the editor of uh, Saturday Night. I phoned up Ann Kingston and said, there's a wonderful piece I'd love you to do. It's about the guy in Woodstock, Ontario, who won the lottery, $36 million, and didn't cash the ticket for 364 days. He, one day before it expired, because he spent those 364 days conspiring with his lawyer to figure out how to screw his wife his mistress and his ex-wife out of as much of it as possible. She said, I love that story. And in fact, I know one of the lawyers involved. And in fact, I'm working on a book right now called The Meaning of Wife. <laughs> it's perfect for me. What do you pay? I said, 4,000 words, $4,000. 20 years later, she said, do you think my fucking gas cost what it cost in 1985 for my rent? Or and she couldn't do the piece. She said, I can't afford to do it. It's like two or three months' work, yeah. full time. I can't do it. So it's just, that's symptomatic of what's going on. And of course, the internet has, has you know, cursed freelance writing because they expect you uh, on the web to do 400 word pieces that have some substance, you know, for 50 bucks or whatever. So it's a really, really difficult business to enter into right now, I must tell you. It's never been more perilous, I don't think, more tricky. So you're brave souls to be, you know, 
thinking this is what you want to do and this is what, what you can do. And I think you're smart to really investigate how to go about it and where some money can be had and whether you ought to be taking photographs or shooting video and what the needs of the publication are and so forth.